Donald, what are we here for today? Well, Tom, we are going to write a book. <laughs> I guess that's the only way to put it. And this book is going to be about communism. So that'll be pretty interesting, I think. The origin of this story is with the uh, something you've written about and talked about a lot in the past, this fundamental principles of communist production and distribution by a guy called Jan Appel and a group of international communists published way back in 1930. You led me to this book indirectly because you posted a video. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, Council Communism Rocks or something to that effect. Yeah, I didn't. My eye. I didn't. I don't remember making that video when you pointed out to me. I was like, Donald, where the hell did you? Where the hell did you like find out about my podcast? And you mentioned that. I was like, I, I said to myself, I've I've never done a video called that. <laughs> and then you showed it to me. I was like, oh, yeah, Christ, I did. Yeah. But like for me, the the fundamental principles, like it's a hell of a book. You know, to me, it's a lost classic. Like with all the kind of stuff I've read, you know, to me, the it stands second only to capital from a kind of a commie economics point of view from what, what I've read. What's so special about it, Donald? Yeah, extraordinary book. I think we both came to the conclusion kind of independently because I saw your video, which was just a little bit about it. And then I went off myself and read it. The first edition of it was online already. So I read that. And yeah, I was just, I, I guess I read it, you know, almost in one sitting or you know, pretty close because it's just a really, just a really incredible text that it, it lays out the possibility of an economy that is self-directed where there is no need for the external administrative apparatus of a, what would be, what we would think of as a Leninist state, but that in keeping with and I think directly drawn from what Marx was talking about in, for example, Critique of Gotha, the idea of an economy where the associated producers themselves are in control of the production and distribution system. And because they're in control of the production and distribution system, the political institutions, the cultural, the social institutions of the society will be under their control. And that's something that I think goes right to the heart of what we would, what both of us would see in, in what that means to us and what communism means to us. You know, I've read a, a number of different books talking about, you know, the critique of the Gotha program and insights into Marx's thoughts on communism. But like this book just, for me, just completely like unzipped the comments in, it, it's like a, like the critique of the Gotha program is like a zip file of, of this book, whereby it basically, it just completely expands in a way that totally makes sense of Marx's ideas of a self-directed society. And it, most importantly, the most important thing about this is the nature of the system being based upon labor time accounting. Why is this so important? Okay, so yeah, I mean, it's a huge a huge question you could just talk about that for you know for the whole for our whole talk now but like some of the main kind of reasons that that's important is because if you have a system of labor time accounting which is capable and the fundamental principles book outlines in a general sense how it is capable how it is possible if it is capable of being utilized by the producers themselves in order to establish a system of relative prices, which are cost prices, the integrated labor that is embodied within the goods and services in the economy, then there is no need, and indeed there's no place for, there's no material basis for either the private firms of capitalism or the state planning bureau that will make all of the decisions about what everything will cost and how much everything will be produced and so on and so forth that you see in the Leninist economy. So it's really just a, a totally different paradigm. And I think it's exactly what Marx was getting at when he was talking about communism right at the beginning. You know, as you say, I think they unzipped it, this whole idea of what he was saying and, and, and Engels too and anti during of a kind of labor time based economy. How would that look? What would be the 
as they say, fundamental principles? What would be the things that you absolutely require for for that to be implemented? Right. So this, I work 10 hours, I get 10 hours worth of produce as my income is directly linked to your amount you work. So there's like a one-to-one relationship there. There's no space for a planner to come in and say, oh, well, Tom, Don, you two, we should only really give you six because we've decided, right, we got to build 5,000 nuclear bombs because 4,000 nuclear bombs is not enough. We need an extra thousand, right? There's 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 no space between there because there's a one to one relationship between your hours worked and your income, because that we're using your labor time as the measure to base all the calculations in the economy upon. There is no space to get in there. The only person, the only people that can decide to give up some of their income is like mutually about what they agree upon that they want to do in common. Yeah, exactly. So they could decide that they want to spend uh, money on defense because, you know, they could decide they want to spend money, on uh, not money, excuse me, they want to spend resources, they want to spend, they want to produce goods and services and, and redirect some of those goods and services away from, let's say, the consumption of the population and towards different things, right? They could do that the same as today it's done or the same as it was done in the USSR. But the key thing is, as you say, because of the labor time accounting, the way that that's being done is that the associated producers themselves are effectively withdrawing consumption from themselves. The associations of producers are doing this in order to achieve these, whatever these kind of aims, these social goals are. So it's not a question of some external group who are saying, okay, we need to take 25% of all produced goods and send it to the military, or we need to you know, spend a big amount of society's produce on something else or you know there's no material basis for that because the political institutions the social institutions only operate with the kind permission of whatever people are in charge whoever has ownership of the productive apparatus and one of the things that group of international communists really emphasize is that if the producers themselves have that control then they will determine if a political party has that control then the leaders of that political party will determine, you know, the central committee. If uh, private capitalists control them, uh, own the means of production, they will determine the political institutions, the social, the cultural institutions, and so on of the society. So the labor time accounting is the mechanism through which the associated producers are able to enforce their, you know, both production and allocation. In the book, we are going to use the lens of Marx's critique of capitalism and in the value form to understand the pitfalls that are posed by a lot of the existing attempts or proposals for a socialist slash communist society. All of these, as far as I am aware, they are wedded to what in the fundamental principles they call a, a price policy, which is basically society determining what price to give to certain goods external to purely the labor time, the amount of labor in the good. So why is it so key for us to not go down the route of a price policy? So one of the reasons that the left has been very wedded to this idea of a price policy is it goes right back to the very early social democratic economists in the socialist tradition who felt that If you have a price policy, what you can do is you can politically determine the price of goods and then by paying workers less than the amount of um, money that they would require in order to buy the total amount of goods produced, you can appropriate the remainder of the goods and use them for whatever it is that the political leadership, advanced political leadership of the workers has decided you know, is the appropriate way to spend the surplus, you know. So we would reject that whole framework, right? We would say that that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you know, what you've what you've kind of done is you've created a group of people who have ownership, real ownership, real control over the productive apparatus and can say to the workers, can say to the whole population, here are your work quotas, here's what you're going to get paid. 
we're going to appropriate the rest and do what we want with it. And of course, the result is what is what we got. You know, you have workers striking against the socialist society, supposedly the socialist society. You have constant struggle, people looking for lower quotas and more time off. And so and this is not something that would have been envisaged because it goes against the whole spirit of the thing. You know, it goes against the whole idea. So that's one reason why we would reject the, the price policy, because it's fundamentally in contradiction to what we would want. But there are also other practical reasons. Like, so one of the things that left-wing governments have always been at is this kind of cheap food or cheap or basic goods populism, where you want to, you think it will be popular to reduce the price of goods below their production costs. And of course, the result is shortages and the result is, uh, you know, or alternatively, you raise the prices of things that you want people to discourage people from buying and create black markets, you know. So fiddling with prices, I think both at least fiddling with them too much, you know, has negative practical consequences, but our objection to it is even more fundamental. And it's something that like, point you made to me before was that like you know th this whole idea that of the socialist calculation debate it's like they've unnecessarily seeded the grand to von Mises and Weber and these people and Hayek where they say oh the price must contain all information about the society you know but in reality the price of the good in, in Marx's system the labor time the labor time price of of a, of a component all it is telling us is that this is how difficult it is to do this, right? Yeah. It's not saying you should do this, yeah? This is a point that I think is very deep. It's like, you know, when you have a rationally planned e economy based on labor time, you can see we have 25 trillion hours of labor each year that we can spend. This stuff takes this much labor. Should we do this stuff or not? Yeah, and it's it's a, it allows, you know, the common woman and man on the street to understand what's involved with the price and how the economy works. And it, 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 it demystifies. That's one of the great powers of the labor time accounting as well. It like yeah. it demystifies where value, like what determines the price to this day. If you ask, if you went out on the street and you asked a hundred people, you know, what, what, why is a, a certain commodity, a certain price? They might say, Oh, it's the supply or it's the demand or all this, you know, they rarely will say it's it's the amount of labor time taken to do it. You know, and I think it, it, it's very, very clarifying. So one thing we need to get onto a little bit then is talk about the guild and how the nature of these guilds that that the fundamental principle talks about, how this differs from how capitalism reproduces itself and what are the implications? Right. So the group of international communists refer to the associations of producers that Marx talked about, sometimes as associations, sometimes as guilds. But what they're talking about is that you have sub-industries within the economy. You do not have competi inter-firm competition as we have today, because you have the whole idea is that you have an economy that is based on cooperation. And this cooperation is kind of something that you cannot get out of. So I don't want to you know, dive into other things that you haven't brought up yet. But I think it is appropriate to say fundamental to the existence of the associations is the existence of something called the public ledger. So it's a single account rather than firms having private accounts private, as today. You have a single public accounts system, which is a single unified system that every firm that wants to take part in the normal legal economy and um, the economy of the communist society has to be involved in. And this ledger records the integrated labor of goods and services as they're produced and brought into transfer between firms and transfer to consumers. So in order for a firm to have its goods recorded on the ledger and being able to therefore receive uh, labor tokens, their own ability to consume, and also the materials and capital goods that society creates, so in order for them to be able to do anything, they have to join one of these associations. They have to become a part of a guild. So what is the, what's the function of an association like this? Well, a number of functions. First of all, they would be responsible for the basic kind of regulatory functions. So what you would be interested in 
from a regular point of view is how much of society's materials and capital goods and uh, labor hours, direct labor hours, are being used to produce whatever it is you're producing. Could be a service, could be some kind of good. And this would be done in such a way that you would join an association which represents the sub-industry which you are interested in producing things for. So you might have a firm that makes multiple things. They could be in multiple. So a, a factory, we're down the road, we're a shoe factory, you want to join the shoe guild. Right. We join the shoe guild. One thing that happens in capitalism is that the, the, the firms themselves are, they are at, they're basically left to their own devices. They have to sink or swim on their own devices. How does it differ, say, from the idea of like this kind of a, a council communism? What you have, you have to remember here, is a cost price economy where goods and services are being produced at their cost prices. So firms are not trying to seek a profit. That's not, seeking a profit is actually not logically possible, right? Because the goods are being disposed of, they're being transferred on in the economy to others at their average cost of production of the particular good. So we're talking about shoes. We have a particular model of shoe. It's being transferred at the average cost of production of every factory that makes that shoe. So, yeah, there's not a question of the firm making a profit and therefore reinvesting more and so on. What there is a question of is the firm being able to reproduce itself. So the integrated labor cost of the shoes have to be made in such a quantity and and so on that they are able to, to cover the expense from society's point of view that went into producing. So if the firm is able to reproduce itself and the association is able to reproduce itself, and the whole economy is reproducing itself, all creating goods and services at cost prices. This is the nature of the communist economy. So you have this kind of, and I hope we can get into it more, this kind of regulatory system that is different to the capitalist one. So the capitalist one is using this law of value. It's using this kind of like control thing of you make things for profit. If it's not profitable, you can't make it. You're out of business, you know. In, in communism, you have it a bit different here. You have cost price production, but it must be able to support its own production. It must be able to cover its costs. So there's five shoe factories. They all create their shoes. The average time it takes all those in the guild to create a shoe is the price of the shoe. And so right. when all of the shoes sell, that, that means that all of them together as a bunch are reproduced. It's not that the three best ones are are being reproduced and the bottom two go out of business, they all get reproduced. That's so right. we have we have this kind of communal reproduction. But we do not have a reward system like capitalism where there's competition and profit, which allows the system autonomously to direct investment and money towards the most productive stuff. Like wh- what is the equivalent in our system? Okay, so first of all, yes, that's correct. So when you have you have this group of firms and it's making this product, some of them, the, the, the product has been disposed of at its average production cost. So some of them will have a deficit and some of them will have a surplus at the end of having disposed of their products. Another function of the association is to is to then amortize the entire thing, is to say the all five firms break even because the average takes account of the both the deficits and the surpluses and the entire as a group they break even you know so as far as the capitalist we could say from a sort of cybernetics point of view this kind of or rather i suppose we could say from a it's the kind of language of reinforcement learning this idea of you've got cost function you've got a reward function so you know you have that in capitalism the reward function is is kicking in when you do something right and you make a profit and then you do more of that. So as far as this sort of communist version, if you like, of the cost and reward function that capitalism has, what we have, remember, is a is a cost price economy. Goods are being produced at their real cost prices. So the issue is that as productivity increases, on the one hand, you have your hour of labor is going to more goods and services, right? On the other hand, in your own workplace, when the productivity of labor is increasing, and of course there's some certain amount of demand out there, but the productivity of labor is increasing, you know, maybe quite quickly uh, with the uh, bringing in a new machine or whatever, what you're going to see is your own hours of work 
the hours of work that are performed at this factory maybe uh, will be falling. And the situation would therefore, this would impact on, on you in two different ways. First of all, your individual consumption, the labor tokens you take home would tend to fall. So now you've got an issue and you have to discuss it at the community level, at the workplace level. You've got to say, we need to innovate here. We need to find new goods and services that people want and which are more labor intensive, right? As new goods and services generally are. You make these new goods and services. You again, if you want to do this, you can you can produce them at the factory with again, claiming the material and capital goods and working time associated with that and increase your own consumption and also increase what is available for, let's say your local community or your region and so, or so on to be able to take more goods and services for free allocation. This is the mechanism through which the drive is built in so that workers will be interested in innovation and not only in innovation, but crucially in transforming the innovation into goods and services, which they need to produce and get out the door in order to sustain their own consumption. On the other hand, if they did want to allow their own consumption to fall, or not even to fall, maybe just to just to stand still over time because goods are getting cheaper as productivity is increasing, what they can do is they can simply allow their working day to decrease. So it's a balance for workers between do I want to consume more or maybe I just want to consume the same and we'll just allow, we'll just work six hours a day instead of eight. There's the two, like there's a bifurcation here between like the ability to go, yeah, more free time. But also, also this is like, oh shit, our factory has got less hours now. We yeah. need to innovate. So we got these two motivations at the same time. Driving right, contradictory motivations. But remember, because there is automation happening in the economy all the time, what you will see is that your hour of labor minus deductions will be worth more and more. Or the extra hours of work will mean less and less to you over time. So we have, I think you described it before as a sort of tendential fall in the working day, as opposed to of the rate of profit, which you get in capitalism. Yeah, that'd be a nice one, wouldn't it? The tendential fall so. in, the, in the working day. So like, there's, there, there's so much we've got to discuss. Like we've, we've been doing so much like reading and research and teasing apart a lot of the different concepts that that are in the book and building upon them. But one thing I, I kind of found quite, I don't know what you have to say about this as a kind of a general point. It's like, you know, they say like, in, uh, I read some like history of science stuff and they say, you know, like a, a, a new idea comes up and then like, there's a very fruitful blast of ideas. One thing I found like when more coming from you, I think like you you were asking me, well, how would this how would this thing actually goddamn work? Like, is this what you're saying, or th is this that a lot of ideas just flow very, very, very naturally out of these fundamental principles we've been talking about? That's been my experience of us doing the doing the research here. Yeah, absolutely right. It's like when you said about the the fundamental principles book itself being the zip file of Marx's previous work, I feel like what we're doing now is really taking the fundamental principles as a zip file, you know, and opening it up because so much, once you, once you start on any of the aspects of the fundamental principles that they're talking about, things, as you say, naturally flow out of them that are, that almost couldn't be any other way, you know, that are very, very kind of fundamental themselves in the sense of, you can see exactly where they're going. So like, I, I think that a lot of the criticisms of this book have been from people who have read the book, taken all of it simply as it is, and not really, they haven't done what we've done, you know, which is not to take away from them. They're probably, you know, fantastically uh, clever guys and so on, and uh, people who have looked at this, but, but you need to, when you read this particular book, I think you need to consider steps one, two, three, four, five, beyond what they're saying and say, where does this lead? Like, you know, and tease it out. And that's what we've spent many months doing now, I guess. Yeah, it's, pro so. it's probably over a year now we've been essentially doing some of this this research and work ourselves, putting together a lot of different writings. 
Yeah, another element that we're going to get into as well in the book is like kind of critiquing like the idea of central planning as an idea, as a concept. You know, I, I think like we've done a lot of research as well into cybernetics. And it's one thing that really flows out of Stafford Beer's work where he puts this great emphasis on like what actually is planning, what planning is in, 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 in capitalism. Like we have this concept of like for me that's very very important of marxism is that like communism like is will have the birth marks of a capitalist society and look to capitalism there is not a central plan in capitalism there are central planning nodes like central banks and banking institutions and governments and local authorities and different layers of planning there is not a one year plan Right. There is not a five year plan. Certain plans, a bridge takes three years to build and other things takes 20 years to do in for rail infrastructure. Another thing takes a week to design a new dress. The planning is done uh, in many different time scales concurrently. Yeah. And, you know, I, I feel like that this is something like we, we will really be hammering in the book, the idea of of a central plan. And we're going to pick apart like from Marx's theory, why exactly we think all existing kind of socialist planning ideas have gone off. Well, except not, not including, say, the GIC or the syndicalists, but uh, have gone off in entirely, entirely the wrong direction. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, one of the one of the funny, interesting things about centrally planned economies was that it was always kind of a myth, you know, this this. It was there was always a great deal of propaganda about this idea that it really was a five year plan that was conceived and then executed. And in fact, what happened was it was continually modified at all levels throughout the entire thing because there's no other way to do it. You have your plan, you try to put it into action, all kinds of things happen that you didn't expect. There are multiple overlapping, as you said, short term, medium term, long term plans. The scheduling doesn't work. Uh, all kinds of things, all sorts of unforeseen things and possibly foreseeable things. And one of the things uh, Stafford Beer was talking about, as you mentioned, was that in actual planning, how actually actual planning works is that it's a continuous process. It's a dynamic process. It's plans being started, being discontinued, being picked up again and again, overlapping over all kinds of time periods, both within firms and between firms. And between, as you say, central nodes and between smaller nodes and, and so on and so forth. Enormous complexity. So I'm here studying cybernetic engineering at the moment. And one of the things that we're, well, I mean, the main thing that we're very interested in doing that is you have a model of a real object. You want to capture the main, not necessarily main, but the characteristics of the object that you are interested in. And in order to achieve viability, this model that you've made has to be able to successfully reproduce the dynamic characteristics, the dynamic processes that are usually expressed in differential equations. Now, what you get with the Leninist, uh, what we come to think of as socialist economies, is a model that doesn't achieve this. It's a model that says you will take this incredibly complex system with all these dispersed nodes, with all these miniature little control loops that all have their own little conservation principle of profit. And you're going to instead take that, you're going to reduce that in complexity enormously to this one system that has a single state trajectory and a single state. And you're going to be able to say, you're going to be able to achieve the same kind of dynamic processes. Well, you're not. And one of the things that you really don't achieve, one of the, the huge things that you lose, and I think people don't talk about it enough, is the emergent property that you get where, again, in reinforcement learning terms, which I think is the kind of terminology we should be using, is this reward uh, function, is this kind of interplay between exploitation and exploration, is this thing of you have all these nodes and they're all doing both things. They're exploiting when they find profit and they're exploring to try to find more opportunities. And that's going on all the time at all levels of recursion with all of these overlapping, interlinking plans and so on. You lose that. And the result of losing that is that 
things that should be produced or things that people would like are not being produced and things that are being produced are not necessarily what should be produced and you simply don't have the in cybernetic terms the requisite variety right in order to handle this problem and that's what gic keeps yes and it's so ironic because when you talk to people about with central planners about what they're always talking about is oh well you know communism has to be more efficient than capitalism to be dominant okay and they think like it's it's very very back ass ways because the central the idea of this centrally node plan came out of the the politics and the dynamics of stuff it did not come out of a theoretical argument because i don't think you can make the case that a static plan is going to be more efficient than a self organizing structure that is planning and doing stuff on the fly to optimize in their local conditions like the, right. the the even idea that the central plan could be more efficient would have to mean that the central plan was being planned every single day replanned you know on some level and but i think this is true and even if it was replanned every even if it was replanned every 10 minutes you still would lose that exploitation versus exploration principle which you get with the sort of organic process exactly you don't have this dynamic idea that we discussed earlier of that shoe factory saying well we, we kind of still want to keep our hours up we got to innovate right the central planner is not going to say like that that motivation for innovation is 100 million times more important than the central planner even in theory being more efficient when in in, in theory it, it's actually not more efficient you know it's going to be more yeah. inefficient right you know the, the dedication to Stafford Breer like our the dedication he has at the start of his brain the firm book he says absolutum obsoletum it's if it works it's out of date right. and you know <laughs> i think that fits very well with the critique of a central planned socialism never mind the actual self directed free producers you know a society of free and equal producers being dictated from a central node like the problems of that you know never even minding that whole canard so we're going to be introduced we're going to have a lot of detail and a lot of stuff here we're going to have we're going to have stuff on the anthropology what we can learn from anthropology about how it would impact say the GIC but another thing that always comes up like literally the first thing people have asked about when I we would talk about the fundamental principles is the idea of of fraud in the system and this is like something that was entirely endemic in like actually existing inverted commas socialist states we're going to be putting a lot of emphasis on game theory and how the society can govern itself to mitigate the experiences of actually existing co- communist or socialist states so in terms of uh fraud prevention specifically which was as you say just a huge constant problem in the past with what was described as socialist economies one of the things that i think one of the great strengths in gic is that they have this public ledger they have this record of society tracking its own costs and then they're able to use this from in a distributed way in such a way that the producers are effectively monitoring themselves monitoring each other it's because they're in these associations and they can keep track of any kind of irregularities they can keep track of any kind of things that don't look right from an economic point of view from a, on the economic basis so there's a lot of subdivisions within that that we can talk about but i can just touch on a few i guess uh, for now first thing you could say is well historical information so you've got information already today but you would also have information in this communist society that's proposed and within that uh, you would be able to see the historical claims by this industry for the goods they're producing for the specific goods right so we used to make a shoe it used to take us 2 hours to make a shoe right. all of a sudden now we're saying it's 2 and a half hours to make a shoe what the hell's going on lads right this should be something that is not very common obviously but also because it's a distributed kind of regulatory situation with these associations 
you don't place all of the burden for that on some kind of central node that has an impossible task of trying to figure out why uh, all of the millions of products might possibly cost more or less. You know, I don't want to go too deeply into this, but we have considered in quite huge amount of detail the ways in which that the associations could regulate themselves and would be motivated to regulate themselves. Another one of the mechanisms through which you'd regulate yourself is this kind of cross comparison. So you say a firm is, as you say, two hours uh, making a particular good in terms of integrated labor time, but in the next region over, it's an hour and a half. And in the another region, it's an hour and uh, 35 minutes and so on. And you would be able to see both the changes over time, but also the relative levels. You'd be able to see the claims that are being made in terms of the capital goods that are available. So maybe there's a machine that can do it faster in one place or another. Maybe there's a regional event that explains some kind of change. For example, I'm here in Russia. Uh, we have uh, sanctions at the moment. That could be the kind of event that can cause uh, some kind of dislocation, disruption. COVID-19, something like that can happen. A war can happen. All kinds of things can happen that causes dis that cause dislocation. So it's not that the associated producers would be in a situation of constantly checking every time that you know there's some kind of dislocation. It's when there are dislocations in the system that are not explainable by um, what you might expect. Like so, the the analysis of beer and the VSM and this idea of like algodonic signals being fired, pain signals, like these ideas are uh, really core to the concept of the GIC. To me, like you have this idea of the centralized general ledger. All the firm's transactions are open and on this general ledger, and literally these algodonic signals only fire really when 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 needed. So we have all the information sitting there. Uh, you would have a, you can imagine a guild, the shoe manufacturers guild, having like a dashboard like Google Maps or something, and it just goes bing, you know, the labor time has gone up crazy in this one factory, something's going on. Can we help lads? How do we, how do we fix this? Blah, 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 blah. The whole thing is very self-regulating, you know, exactly. and, and, and open. So like y you sitting here and I'm sitting here in Woolwich, you might see, that factory down the road there, like, let's have a look and see what's going on there. Like, because the, the boys there, they seem to be Dawson all the time, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, and uh, another thing, which I think is important to point out without again going into like too much unnecessary detail at this point, but um, which could be very boring, but just to say that I think uh, a very important aspect of that would be that the people who are sort of who are empowered to be able to at least initiate some kind of inquiry in a, in a case like that are also the people who are most incentivized, who are most directly affected by the dislocation, you know, and in that way, again, they have that kind of motivation, you know, so, and there are, there are like, I, we feel uh, very clear ways to do that, that can be uh, really, really effective where, again, the people who are the most affected are the people who are in the position to be able to sort of call out those kinds of, issues one thing i think as well with the whole general idea behind the gic and and all these ideas that flow out of it um you know we're not giving a, a blueprint of every single how right. to do it that's absolutely not what the book could be doing but we're going to show like these second order principles that flow out of these earlier principles but one thing that to me seems so good about it is that it really seems to get back towards what marx's general ideas were and what the anarchists ideas were if not in political economy terms but in their in in how they wanted things to operate there, it's no coincidence that like the the council communist literature doesn't get printed by marxist presses it generally gets printed by anarchist presses and i mm. I, I feel like what the gic and what marx gives us and like hopefully what, what we'll contribute as well to it will be a vision for not just like people who come from the more Marxist aisle, like myself and yourself, but for like from the anarchist wing, because I feel like it's, it's so copacetic. It, it just feels like for me, it's like syndicalism with a working political economy. Yeah. I, I really hope so. I really hope that people will engage with this. that uh, Would not describe themselves straight away as Marxist because 
Uh, first of all, I would encourage everyone to read GIC. I think that's that's a that's a brilliant thing to do, no matter what your political background is. I think it, it's it's so thought provoking that that alone is just worth doing just for its own sake. But if you're really interested in how what Marx was talking about, an association of free producers, which I think people, a lot of people from the anarchist tradition would also, you know, find to be very uh, core to their beliefs. I hope they will engage with what we're writing because what we aim to do, again, is not, it's not a blueprint, but it's answering a lot of the potential problems, not problems, but a lot of the things that are left unsaid, a lot of the things that are left unresolved in group of international families where people read it and they say, well, I don't know. You've got, you've got issues. You've got outstanding issues here. And what we aim to do is say, these issues are absolutely solvable. And there are very simple, elegant ways to solve them that, that everyone can get behind, you know? So fundamentally in, in the book, what we hope to achieve through like a, a firm understanding of Marx's critique of capital, a firm critique of the existing proposals for socialism and are building upon the fundamental principles that we, we should be able to really answer the critique that like people have, I think, of the fundamental principles is that it doesn't describe an economy at all. Like, and there's two things I think I'd like to say about that critique. One is that like, to me, what is fundamental in capital? For me, what's fundamental in capital is private property and the social relations, those that have and those that don't and those that have to work and that those who own and reap the, reap the surplus. Okay, the, that's the fundamental basis of capitalism. The market, money, all this other stuff that comes after it, they are epiphenomena on these core criteria, right? And what the fundamental principles gives us is the equivalent for communism. It gives us the equivalent fundamental things. Now, we are going to be building on out some of those epiphenomena. And they fall on your lap. Like, that's the way I felt it. I felt like the stuff that we've done, we've actually come up with, I think, quite a number of conceptual additions to the, to, to the theory, to be honest. And I think they didn't take much for them to fall in our lap. So that, that's one thing I really want to say, that, like, the fundamental principles are the fundamental principles. What we are going to discuss and critique about the other ones is like errors with the flaws of them but also then we're going to build we're going to build these second and third order principles that they're they're a natural consequence of what's in that book the fundamental principles absolutely yeah and if i could bring up one of the criticisms that have been has been made in the past, you, you said that the fundamental principles has been described by people as being not really the fundamental principles you know because they miss some of the key things, you know, they miss some of the really important things that, that really make an core... economy work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, and one of the things that, that has been said in the past is that they ignore planning, you know, or, or they ignore the equivalent. Okay. Because in capitalism, they say you've got profit in, in a planned economy, you've got work quotas and people just have to do it. So first of all, that's wrong. That's just wrong. You know, it's just not correct. So, if you read the GIC, they go into planning. They say very clearly that the communist economy will involve what we would call, I suppose, indicative planning. In the same way that you would have a state today that would make an annual budget, for example. So you've got a two layer thing. You've got in capitalism, you've got a state sitting on top, the capitalist state. You've got underneath this kind of dynamic, automatic semi-automatic at least, regulative, kind of homeostatic, semi-homeostatic control system, distributed control system, capitalist market. In communism, what they're arguing is the same thing. They say communism needs this distributed, self-regulating, homeostatic control system. And then on top of that, you've got the, the layer, which is effectively where what they call GSW and MIE, right? You've got these organizations, which are responsible for the provision of services, which are responsible for building bridges, which are responsible for, you know, power stations and all this kind of different things. But, you know, crucially and in common with capitalism, what they're actually doing is they're drawing on the goods and services 
that are provided by this automatic system. And their planning is changing as time goes on, as a capitalist state does as well, you know, where you have a capitalist state would change what its plans are in light of changing economic situations. The economy tanks, the plans have to change. Certain programs get gutted, other things get expanded that they didn't intend to expand, whatever it might be, bailouts, financial aid to people and so on. In, in communism, you've got the same kind of dynamic in GIC. They do have planning, but they say it's not the comprehensive planning of trying to assign production quotas and prices to everything in the economy. It's the planning that you have an automatic system and then you have this system, which is the uh, organizations which are for the common, which are for common purposes. And, and they talk about that, you know, so the idea that really what you have with GIC is you have a uh, an economy of creating use values, a market of use values, which these organizations that are responsible for social aims are also drawing on at their production costs. And then you don't have what you have in the capitalist market. You don't have a market of exchange value. You don't have a market of prices being set by independent producers according to market value, according to price. So that's the difference. That's not to say there isn't planning. There's huge planning, just like there is in capitalism. There's, there is innumerable distributed overlapping and interlinking plans all over the place. So that's what I would say about that. I think it's a, just a point that a lot of people miss. You know. Also, what's very important to us in our style of writing is that we really want the style of writing to be very, very, very clear so that like, you can take up this book without knowing Marx's theory. You can get an understanding for the core bits of Marx's theory of capitalism. You can understand and get a, an, an idea for how these other proposals that we're going to critique work, what's wrong with them, and how the GIC, the fundamental principles, solves these problems. So, like, for, for us, it, it is really important for us that, like, a person can pick up this book and read the whole thing and be able to follow it, even though these sometimes are kind of dense theoretical debates like it's very important for us that it's it's written in an incredibly clear and concise way yeah like frankly this is not a book for academics this is a book for for people this is a book for workers this is a book that we would hope would be widely read and i think that's that's really our aim that no prior knowledge is required as you say in parts because it's unavoidable there will be you know elements that are that are dense but not inaccessible and i think that's yeah that's really important for us we want it to be something that that really pretty much anyone can pick up and be able to grasp what we're driving at which is i think very important as well to say that the critiques that we'll be doing of the existing socialist planning texts will be not uh, running them down, not saying they don't know what they're talking about or anything else. We would just present it as in its own terms, in its, an objective kind of as much as we can way that says this is what they are advocating in all of these different respects. And then putting forward to say why we think that they're wrong, both in a, the technical problems and also in the really the political questions, you know, about communism. I think it's fair to say we think they're all way off, you know, <laughs> like uh, quite far from Marx's idea uh, as he spoke about it and quite far from GIC, which I think is in directly in that tradition. Yeah, and, and that's not to say that certain elements aren't integrable into the GIC. I think we do take on board concepts from the others that do sit very, very easily with, with the fundamental principles. But certainly a lot of a lot of the stuff does, unfortunately, gets taken to the vet and gets put down. Yeah, true. In particular, I mean, on the grounds of the labor time accounting on the one hand and on the grounds of the distributed organization of the economy with the necessary dynamics for viability. So on those two grounds, I think some of the existing works that are out there come up short on 
One or the other or both? 100%. Well, on that note, Donald, uh, let's wrap it up and maybe we can direct people to the website, which we've called initially The Class of Society in Motion. That's a provisional title for the book. Whether it'll stick or not, we don't know. <laughs> and we have a website about, about the book and who we are and basically also what we're hoping to do is we're we're we basically are going to ask people to see if they can help us fund the work because it's going to be it is a lot of work i've been working on it for the last year quite heavily and i know you have too donald and our plan is to try and finish the book in the next 12 months that's probably going to affect uh, our ability to earn money and stuff so it would really help us. I know I already have a Patreon going here, so it's like, you know, but this one is going half the Donald. We're going to split it down the middle. So this will help us buy our materials and uh, pay our rent and put food on the table and stuff like that. So we're going to direct people there. I'm going to direct them at the start of every show that we, we do to, to send us over there. So it would really make getting this book written in 12 months doable. And everybody who donates will get a, a signed copy of the book and be included in the acknowledgements. So there you go. What do you think about that, Donald? Yeah, sounds good. Sounds like a good offer. <laughs> <laughs> signed copies, signed copies. Yeah, although it might be quite difficult to coordinate both of us signing them, considering you know, you're behind the iron, iron curtain at this stage. That's true, but we'll figure it out, so don't worry. <laughs>